I had an opportunity to drive up in the mountains a couple days this weekend and reminding me of just how beautiful spring, especially spring in the south is with the dogwoods and the red bud trees uh, blooming and uh, got to see uh, uh, just some beautiful vistas with splashed with color reminding us again that God renews our, our, uh, our, the world around us each and, every, each and every day. Also get back and reminded that, it's, that those buds and blooms bring with them uh, other kinds of things that aren't so fun. Uh, and I imagine many of you are dealing with that as I am here lately. But uh, so God bless you and, and we'll get through this. Enjoy the scenery out there and, and enjoy uh, the blessings that God has, has given us. We're moving on from our Exodus series. We, we finished our Exodus series last week, and the book of Exodus leaves us with a beautiful image, just to, by way of reminder. The image at the end of the book of Exodus is the image of Israelite camped in the wilderness, surrounded by the hostility of the wilderness, surrounded by uncertainty that certainly lie ahead of them, surrounded, them, sur- surrounded by nothingness, And yet, they had a promise. They had a vision of what God had for them. They had the tabernacle in the middle of their camp with the cloud over it that represented God's presence. And at the end of Exodus, it told us that when when the cloud rested over the tabernacle, the people stayed put where they are, where they were. And when the when the cloud rose up above the tabernacle, the people would prepare to move because God was leading them. In that, in that scenario, out there in the wilderness, in the middle of nothingness, in the middle of uncertainty, in the middle of hostility, God was present with them. God assured them that he would be with them, and as long as he was with them, and as long as they continued in keeping his commands and decrees and in serving him, that he would take them to a promised land, a land that he said was flowing with milk and honey. And so that's how, we're, that's how we're left, of a beautiful image of God dwelling among his people in a very real way. It's the kingdom of God. It's an image that we'll see at the very end of the New Testament. In the book of Revelation, as we, get a, as we glimpse a vision of what God has for us later, one day after this life is over, where God dwells among his people, and he's surrounded by them. But in between where they were at the end of Exodus and the time in which they lived in the promised land, they had some challenges to go through. They had, a, they had to have a way to get there. You know, initially they, they failed. They went to the, the edge of the boundaries of the promised land. They spied it out. The spies came back. You remember 12 spies. Ten of them says, we can't do this. Too big. Too many people. Too much going on there. We simply aren't able. Two of them said, you know, if we've got God, we can do anything. But two of them wasn't enough. The people rebelled. They said, we're not going to do this. And God says, well, then you're going to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Until this generation passes away, I don't want them to have anything to do with the promise that I had for them. And that's exactly what happened. They continued wandering in the wilderness. They fought a few battles because people attacked them or tried to take advantage of them. But they were still surrounded by the the hostility, surrounded by the uncertainty, but even through their rebellion and even through their wickedness, God remained with them and God stayed. In the book of Deuteronomy, which is where we're gonna be this morning, Deuteronomy chapter six, Robin read the first few verses of that for us. In the book of Deuteronomy, they begin to set out on their quest. And in the first few chapters of the book of Deuteronomy, God says, I want you to pass through the land of, of Esau's descendants and the land of some of Lot's descendants without causing any trouble. Pay for the food that you, that you take, allow, work with them and pass through their territory. Don't be a threat to them. But then you're gonna come to a, to a couple of other territories. Territories that are that lie in proximity to what would be their, their main promised land. And those peoples, I'm going to give into your, into your hand. There was a king of Bashan named Og. Great name. 
He had an iron bed. That was his, his greatest characteristic. If you read in the book of, uh, of Deuteronomy, that was an outstanding characteristic because his bed was 14 feet long. And we can only imagine he needed that for a reason, right? He was probably a big guy. They, but they were able to take them without, without any difficulty because God was with them. There was another guy named Sihon, and he was the king of Heshbon. You can check my pronunciations if you want to, but there's some rough ones in there. They were able to take him as well, and they began their conquest of the land of Canaan right there early in the book of Deuteronomy. And then looking forward, God begins to give them some decrees that he especially wanted them to remember once they came in possession of the land that they were going to possess. God knew that they were gonna, there was going to come a time when, as they lived in the land, as they started to, to gain a measure of success that he would surely give them, as they started to, to dominate in the land and as they, they went from a people with no place to a, a people with a home, and as others became more and more subservient to them out of fear of what they could do, he knew the temptations that would come before them, that would come upon them. One of those temptations, obviously, would be to worship the gods of the land. And God said, in my kingdom, there's going to be no other God. If you live in my kingdom, if you live in my presence, if I'm going to be with you, you have to agree on this, on this point. And there's no, no tolerance of any disagreement that I am the one God of this realm and of this kingdom. And that you will love me, he says, here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I'm the only one that you're to worship. And I don't even want you to build an idol to me, God says in, the, in the, what we call the Ten Commandments. I don't even want you to build an idol to me. Worship me as your one Lord and God because I'm going to be with you in a very obvious and visible way. And God was with them in a very obvious and visible way. And so as they stand on the, on the boundary of, of this land that will one day be theirs and they begin to have success, God starts to tell them these things. And he turns to the parents in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And he says, there's got to be a way for you to pass your knowledge, your experiences, and your faith down to the next generation. And there's got to be a way for that generation to pass it down to their generation. We need to go back one slide if we can do that. Can we do that? Back one, need help up there. That next generation was going to need to know what was important. They were going to need a vision. And we have that today as well. We have the generation coming after us. Some have said that there, is, there have been more changes in my lifetime, the lifetime of those who are my age, than, than many generations before. And, the, and that those changes, whether it's just because we're aware of them with the information generation going on, or because they really are just, just rapid changes in our culture, in our society, in our technology, that our children will experience even more, a more and more rapidly changing culture. Some of the direction is great, improved communication, improved abilities to travel throughout the world, to get to know people and to know each other. I think that works for a good cause, but obviously some of those things are not as good as well. As people share different views and different perspectives of the world, and as people start to think, you know, everybody can just believe what they want and everything's fine. That's not good. We've got to have a way within our church, within our families, of passing faith from one generation to the next. It's not something that we can just allow to chance. And often, we kind of do that. We go to church, we take our kids to church, and we think, well, they go there, they'll get it. Maybe in the past, maybe when that happened in the past, less and less so now. We see it. The, the evidence is, is, you can't argue with it. We've got to be more and more intentional about what that looks like. I've told you the story about when my dad went to a, a family reunion with a friend. It wasn't his family. It was the friend's family that, that he was there. But he knew many of them. And he saw something there that he had never seen before, at least not in that way. He saw generations of people who, who had a dedicated, uh, firm grasp of their faith on, in God. 
They were people of, of faith. And, in, and at that reunion, faith, worship, Bible, all of those things were, were discussions among the people there because it was the core of what their family was. God saw, or dad saw this man's great grandfather, his grandfather, him, his children, and even in some generations, children after that, all of whom were Christians who believed in God. And he started to see something became, a light came on for him at that point in time to say, wait a minute, that's the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be that the, that the generation before teaches the generation after, and we leave this legacy of faith that rolls through the generations. That's the way it's supposed to happen. Dad came home, and he shared that with us on multiple occasions. I'll share it with you on multiple occasions. This won't be the last time you hear this story. It may not be the first time you've heard this story. But see, I don't remember things like that, so... You come to me and say, yeah, we heard that before. I'll, I'll probably just say, oh, good. Well, I'm glad I've, glad I've cleared that up. Dad's told us that many, many times. I shared that with my children. And we encourage that, them to share that with their children. And to make a goal of theirs to pass their faith from this generation to the next generation to the next generation. You know, when Dad told us about that, I think we've captured the vision. I think we have it. Thought it was pretty cool. But then when you read Deuteronomy 6, you know, that wasn't Dad's idea. That was God's idea. It was God's idea to be intentional about passing faith from one generation to the next. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he shares that vision with his people. We're going to read some more in that chapter. If you'll turn to that with me. I'm going to start with verse, kind of where Robin left off with verse four, where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land that is large, flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. When you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. Skip down to verse 20. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws of the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. He brought us out, of there, out from there to bring us and give us the land promised, he promised on an oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all of these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as the case is today. And if we are careful to obey all of his laws before the Lord our God, all that he has commanded... That will be our righteousness. So we see this idea of, of God passing down or of people passing down faith to their children and into the generations beyond is something that God has given us. Something that it's a, it's a vision that he's left with his people here and he continues to live with us. In it, he promises that long life, security, and prosperity will remain for the Israelites who are dedicated to him and to his commands. And that those commands are to be a part of a daily regimen, something that the family does, something that their, their life, their ordinary life is wrapped around so that the kids know that this is a core part of who we are. And each family was expected to do that, was expected to have the law of the Lord on their hearts, on their minds, each and every day, and in a multiple and a variety of ways. God encourages the Israelites who are adults in this situation not to just teach these commands, but also to live them, to have passion about them. The idea of loving the Lord your God with all of your heart means that you have passion 
for, for loving him, that you're committed to it, you're dedicated to it. It comes out in everything that you do, that you love the Lord and that your love for him dictates what you do. And as we walk in those, and as they walked in those paths, their children would see that. They would hear the law taught to them on a daily basis. They would know without a doubt what God expected of them and that they were expected to live in those ways. I find it fascinating that God says, when the children ask why, when they ask why they do, why we're supposed to do these things, why does God want us to do these things? God told them, tell them a story when that happens. Tell them about what happened to you. It's not remarkable for us to remember or for us to realize that there were children born in the wilderness that didn't have the experience of standing before the sea, having the Egyptian army pressing in on behind them and watching the sea part before them so that they could go across on dry ground. And then when they got to the other side to turn around to see the Egyptian army bearing on them through the the gap that was in the water when the gap disintegrated and the Egyptians were killed. That had to have been a powerful image. But there were children born in the wilderness that never saw that. And God said to the parents, tell them about that. And then tell them to tell their kids. Tell them to remind them frequently of what God has done for them. And allow that to help to build their faith. Allow that to show them why they believe what they believe. He's given us a similar a similar concept in our, in our time together. There's not a Sunday that goes by, at least in this church, that we don't observe the Lord's Supper, which was given to us as a feast to remember what God has done for us. None of us have the perspective of standing before the cross of Jesus and seeing God in the flesh, submitting himself to the will of those humans that he created and dying on the cross so that our sins could be taken care of, so that we have a life beyond this life. None of us have that perspective. We don't know what it was like to peer into the grave that Jesus was laid and to realize that the tomb is now empty, only to have him appear to us later. We don't know what that's like. We weren't there, but the people who were there wrote it down, shared those words with us, and now as we take those emblems, the bread that represents the body of Jesus, the fruit of the vine that represents his blood, we know what that means because somebody told us. They told us what it means, not just in an intellectual way, but in an emotional, passionate way, a way that says we do this because we want to remember all that God has done for us. I hope you communicate that to your kids if you have them. If you don't have kids right now, I hope you communicate to somebody else's kids. I've got two kids, you can tell them, right? They're here today. Tell any of them about what God has done for you and allow that to be the answer to the wise. Dad, why do we go to church? Well, let me tell you what God's done for us. Dad, why do we have to go to Bible study? Let me tell you something about what Bible study means to me, what it's, how it's changed my life, how it's touched me and made me a better person. Let me tell you about that. I mean, sometimes that answer of because I said so just comes to our lips because we probably heard it from the generation before us. But see if we can get through that, get beyond that and say, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story about what this means to me and why this means it. A couple of important words that we want to remember when it comes to to casting this vision in our families for generational faith for a faith that gets passed from one generation to the next. As Deuteronomy 6 instructs the Israelites to do, God continues to want us to do that. Two words that are important, boundaries and objectives. Those are two really important things when it comes to moving our kids, our, the next generation, and, and then instruct them on how to lead the generation after them in the direction of faith. If you're a a mom, let's say, and you've ever been in the car with, I don't know, three or four or five kids. Have you ever made the mistake of saying, kids, we're going to go out to lunch. Which restaurant do you want to go to? If you haven't had that experience, but you're likely to in the future, let me tell you, don't do that, right? That's going to be a mistake. You're going to look back at that and say, oh, man, I should have done something differently there. 
Because you're going to get four or five different answers. And here's the deal. When they answer you with what they want, they become instantly emotionally attached to that answer. So if I, if I say that and I get Wendy's, Chick-fil-A, and McDonald's, the kid that said McDonald's wants to go to McDonald's just as passionately as the kid that wants to go to Chick-fil-A wants to go to Chick-fil-A. And the other rule is this. When somebody else says it, you instantly don't want to go there, right? That's the way it works. Parents who have had some experience in this field, when they have the opportunity to take kids to eat, they say, kids, we're going to Chick-fil-A. What do you want? What do you Think about what you're going to have there. They don't ask them where they're going. Why? Because good leadership provides direction. Good leadership provides direction. Good leadership in a family answers the question for the family, this is where we're going. And it's really not up for discussion. This is the direction we're going. Sometimes families, as in other entities, churches, other groups do this, survive on the idea of wanting to keep everybody happy, which is, in and of itself, something that isn't possible, right? You can't do that. It simply is not going to work. You go for balance, and what you find is is that the balance goes back and forth. But when you provide direction, when you say, hey, let's go to Chick-fil-A, then everybody's thinking, I want the chicken nuggets. I want the chicken sandwich. Give me some of them waffle fries. They're thinking about how they can engage and be involved in the direction that we're going. And that's what we got to do as a family. Dad and mom, speaking specifically to you. Communicate to your kids, whether they're young kids, whether they're school-age kids, high school, college, beyond adult kids, whatever it is, communicate regularly your vision of living a life of faith, of loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, of that being your family's thing. It's the core of who you are and of what you are. Sure, they may make other choices. That's, that happens. But they won't make other choices without knowing what, you, what your vision is and what your direction is. Mom and dad, it's up to you to set that direction in your family, to give objectives and boundaries to help them meet that direction. Once we set direction, we set objectives that lead us there, and we set boundaries that keep us focused. Boundaries are the or what God gave as far as commands, rules, stipulations, uh, regulations. God gave those things to the people of Israel and says, now I want you to keep those because you've got to stay focused. Focused on the direction that I'm leading you to go. Being the kind of people that I'm calling you to be. And when you love me and you keep my commandments, that's exactly what it is. Love God is the direction. Keeping the commandments are the boundaries. The objectives are going to be doing those things that the, command, that the commandments say to do. The boundaries are not doing those things that the, that the commandments say not to do. And once we do that, as we strive to do that, we walk in the ways of God. In this sermon series, I'm going to share this with, with the other ministers. They're going to, they've got some things they want to say on this too. Next week, Zach's going to be talking about how to disciple your kids and talk about how to make that an intentional part of your family walk. Then you'll hear from the other ministers on down the road. We're going to spend some time talking about what this looks like. And what I'm hoping, what we're hoping, is that once we get through this, you have this generational perspective. And don't worry, if you miss it this time, uh, I'll give it to you another time. Um, If I can go to that last slide, please. Because we're going to continue to keep this in front of the church, this idea of a generational faith, of faith being something that God expects for us to have a plan in our church and in each family, a plan as to how we're going to move our faith to the next generation, how we're going to share with them our dream and our vision of getting that right. There may be other things that we don't get exactly right, but as far as I'm concerned, that's one that we have to get right. We have to have a plan. Again, people are going to do, children are going to make the choices they make. People are going to do what they're going to do. But we have to have a plan for how to get that done 
and we're going to have that. I wish I could say that my wife and I did this perfectly, that we, we had a plan before our kids were born and, and we began to, to execute it and, and, and work it just exactly the way we wanted to. But I think like most, when we were early on, we were just saying, oh, we got a baby, that's great. What are we going to do with this thing? I think like, like that's kind of most of us where we were. But as we began to move forward with that, that as most of you who have had babies in your life know that all of a sudden at some point in time that realization, that crushing realization hits you, hey, this little one's depending on me for some things, depending on me for direction, depending on me for where I go and for how I get there. And I've got to provide that. Sadly, for a lot of parents today in the church and out, the only objective they really has is, have is getting through the day. That's the, that's the objective they can give you. I just got to get through today. I understand circumstances, some circumstances require that being the only objective you have. But in this context, we're challenging us to have much deeper objectives than that. Much deeper direction. Again, I didn't get it perfectly, but one thing I did, I married well. And her mother's here. I married well, and that's important. I may not have been thinking that all the way through at the time that she was this, this gorgeous Italian, so that's probably where my attention was. But I was in a right kind of place, right? I was at a Christian college, and I was at a, I was at a place where, where you hope some of those things come together. But I can't tell you how important that step was, marrying well. Marrying so that I could keep those objectives and have a partner in doing that. So that I could move forward knowing that she was on the same page as I. It would be a lie if I told you that we haven't disagreed on some things. That would be a lie. But it's not much of a stretch to tell you that we've rarely disagreed on direction for our kids when it comes to spiritual things. Rarely disagreed on that one. I can't imagine what it would be like to lead my family in faith if I had to do it on my own. I can't imagine what that'd be like. Some of you are living that, and I understand that. But if you're not married yet, if you're at a point in your life where you're kind of looking forward to those days, let me tell you how desperately important that is. That you marry someone who has the goals and objectives and values that are gonna move you in that direction. This is something you don't wanna have to do alone. And there are people in this room who are doing it on their own and they would tell you the same thing. You can do it, but you don't want to. Marry well. Find someone who shares that faith, shares that direction and join with them in leading your family and passing faith to the next generation. Allow them to partner with you on that. If you're married and, not having, and, and you don't have kids, this is a great time to start talking about some of these things. What's our plan? How are we gonna get this done? How are we gonna move our kids from the dire in the direction away from where our world would lead them and in the direction of faith? You know, right now, the, the prevailing culture, as far as parents go, are telling our parents of young children that you really shouldn't give them any direction. You should let them discover what it is that they wanna do. You should allow them just to discover it and, and support them in being whatever they want to be. And I get that to an extent. I get that to an extent. Obviously, we don't want to be controlling and, you know, the, when the baby's in the hospital, you know, saying, hey, you're going to be a professional football player and then making that happen. But what we do want to do in, when it comes to faith, we want to be intentional about passing faith. And that starts... That can start before you have kids. How are you going to do that? What's your plan? How are you going to get that done? Bringing them to church and Bible class is a great way to start. It's not going to get it done. I mean, the fact that you're here you, and you have children here, that's been a part of your plan, and it's a great part. But it's not all there is. Remember in Deuteronomy, God says, this is something you got to do daily. Right? When you sit down, when you get up, when you walk along the way, be talking about spiritual things be teaching, be instructing, telling those stories of what God did for people back in Bible days and what God's done for me even today. And continue that on a daily basis. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that in this series. 
God looks at the family as the building block of the kingdom. That Christian families are to be those entities through which children are, are introduced to faith, through which they grasp faith, they see it lived out, and then as they go forward in the world, they go forward continuing to bear the image of God into the world. And that's what families are for. That's why, that's what God wants our families to be for, that our kids are going to get it, and they take that from our, from our hands and pass it along into the hands of those who come after them. A lot more to say on this. I want to encourage you to do this. Sometimes I fear to, to talk about things like this because I know that there are, are folks for whom this hasn't worked as they hoped. Folks who have kids who have chosen to go other directions, who've turned away from the family values. You've put it out there, or maybe, maybe you didn't do it perfectly. Well, none of us did. Understand, understand that God knows what you're trying to do. God understands that you've had a plan, that you've acted on your plan the best you possibly could. That Satan has thrown, like he's going to, things into your life to try to trip you up and to try to stumble you. And for some of us, it's had more of an impact than we hoped. God is going to continue to be with you. God is going to continue to empower you to speak into the lives of your children. Even if they're adults, even if they're older adults. And your grandchildren. He's going to give you the power to continue to speak, and that's the power that you have. Keep it up. Don't ever give up. Continue to tell them the stories, what God did for people back in the day, what God's done for us even now. And when they say, why do you do this stuff? Say, let me sit and tell you what God has done for us and allow God to do the rest of the work. There's always hope. If this morning you've gotten away from some of these things, either personally or as a family, I want to invite you to recenter, to refocus on what's really, really, really important. And there is nothing more important than living a life with a focus on Jesus Christ, with a focus on what God has done for us. And if you've gotten, if your life has gotten away from that focus, we want to be here to support you in moving in the direction that he wants you to go. There are going to be people around the room standing during this song that they'll step out into the aisles and you can step out and pray with them. If you have a concern for yourself or someone else that maybe you feel like needs some prayer concern, whatever those concerns are will remain just between you and that person unless you want it to be shared with the congregation. If you tell them you want to, they will. We also, in every service, make it available to anyone who wants to begin that walk with Jesus, who wants to begin that relationship with him. The beginning is to have faith, to believe in his name. And then we're baptized into the body of, into the water to have our sins washed away. And once we come out of there, we're, we live and we, we have a new walk. And that new walk is a walk of faith, a walk that he gives us. That he shows us how to live, keeping his objectives and keeping his boundaries and being what he wants us to be. If you've not begun your walk with Jesus yet, we invite you to do so in that way. And we stand ready to assist you. Whatever you need this morning, we ask you to come and make it known to one of us as we stand and lead this song to encourage you.